That was a very powerfully reasoned and eloquent address. Now, um, I'm going to take questions from the floor. Uh, is there anyone who would like to raise the first, make, offer the first question? In that case, I will offer one myself, um, and that is, my question is this. Um, looking at this very coldly, uh, what would you say is the strength of neoconservatism in British and European politics considered in the everyday vulgar terms of Labour, Conservative and Liberal Democrats? Who are the people? How many? What kind of a f strength does it possess? Um, well, of course, it's a bogey word, as it is here. Um, a supreme a sort of example of the term is, is that generally people really refer to a neocon as a warmonger, of course, as we know, and a hawk, probably Jewish. Uh, all of those canards. Um, and um, one of the few people, I mean, he wouldn't thank me for saying so, but I mean, of course the, the top neocon is Tony Blair. Um, uh, although there are signs that his, cha his chancellor and probably our next prime minister, Gordon Brown, is also a neocon. Only, though, must be stressed on foreign policy. Um, domestically, very, very far away from being neocons. But on foreign policy, I suppose you're halfway there. It's, it's not bad. Um, so uh, it would be Tony Blair that people would look to as, as, as being such a person. Um, otherwise, um, Europeans see neocons as existing only in America. I mean, it's quite interesting that, I mean, there are a large number in Europe. Again, they wouldn't call themselves such. But um, they don't know each other and they don't identify each other. And uh, Interesting enough, it was at a conference recently of conservatives uh, across Europe, and uh, the number of people from the East, former Eastern Bloc who uh, were sort of self-avowed neocons, I mean, they were... I mean, much like the first generation of the neocons here, and it, of course, started out as anti-communists um, and now found themselves in the same stable as the neocons. So I was kind of hopeful. I have to point out slightly disloyally, since I used to work for a conservative prime minister, that you didn't mention the conservative party in that reply. Always best not to these <laughs> days. Um, uh, yes, I mean, occasionally there were, there were some attempts when Cameron became conservative leader recently. There were some attempts to sort of smear him by saying that he was actually a neocon or that he was surrounded by neocons. Um, uh, some of his advisors are people I would say were neocons, people like Michael Gove are, are, are fairly neoconservative, very neoconservative. Um, but no, largely it was an attempt to sort of smear and it didn't quite work because everyone in Britain has sort of recognized that so far David Cameron's talked only of bicycling. Um, and I don't think the word Iraq has come from his lips. So, the gentleman at the back. Sorry. You, you told us that uh, orthodoxy is the, the guiding principle of, of neoconservatism. Well, what is the most important value of neoconservatism that unites its, its views on different issues? Is it, is it orthodoxy or is it something else? Oh, freedom would be the one that single word sprang to mind always. Um, I mean, on domestic policy, that stretches as well, because I mean, freedom from the state um, is, is one of the things that all neocons have argued, um, and which, of course, those few politicians who have been neoconservative on foreign policy have often been rather bad uh, about the freedom thing at home. Yes, another question? The gentleman here in the middle. Would you stand up? <laughs> By the way, could I ask people, when they ask a question, to say who they are and if it's relevant, w w who they represent, what they represent. Um, hi, thank you. Um, my name is Ethan Marin. Um, I'm a student at American University's Law School. Um, I'd just like to quote a question I made about a point you touched on, sir, um, the ceasefire in Lebanon. Uh, you characterized it, if I understand you correctly, as an example of moral relativism at work, an inability to distinguish between Hez Hezbollah's side and Israel's side of the conflict. I have to say, I don't quite see it that way for two reasons. One is that the uh, ceasefire does seem to have given Israel much of what it said it wanted, um, a security buffer to be staffed by Lebanese and international peacekeepers um, up to the Watani River. And second, because even though, yes, it would be very nice if we could totally disarm and destroy Hezbollah, or at least force its conversion to a pure political party without any weapons, um, the reality is that what we've seen over the past few weeks is that even with the very best of intentions on the Israeli side, we get very high civilian casualties in Lebanon during an attempt to actually destroy Hezbollah by military force. 
So it might be a sign not of moral relativism, but of simple prudence and regard for Lebanese civilian life to go for the ceasefire and say, yes, Hezbollah is a problem, but we'll deal with it later and in a somewhat less bloody way. Well, that's a good point. Uh, I, I think not, only because um, I see no desire in the international community to deal with Hezbollah. Um, if they can't obey 1551, I don't see why they're going to obey a new resolution. I mean, how many resolutions do you have to give before Hezbollah get the message? I mean, are they going to take it when we give them three or four? I don't see anyone in Hezbollah who says, look, guys, the UN's given another resolution. Let's, let's, let's destroy our missiles. I, I, see, I see no seriousness in dealing with the issue of disarming Hezbollah. And on the issue of the international force, I see no likelihood that it's going to, it's going to do what it's, it's trying to do. Um, what its mandate w would be intended to be. Um, I think it's a great disaster generally having to put uh, an international force in southern Lebanon. Um, and uh, we all, of course, regret where we are with it. But what is the point of putting a buffer zone between Israel and a terror state, a terror group that's still fully armed? I, I see a return to the status quo ante on this one as being not a draw, but a victory for Hezbollah. A draw that the, the, the terror group punched the nose of a big state, the big state tried to come back and was prevented from doing so. The alternative. <laughs> the alternative. Well, the alternative, first of all, would be I mean, there are, the, the alternative is to deal with Hezbollah, to destroy the 13,000 missiles. I mean, it's better that you have even 3,000 Hezbollah. Uh, and no missiles than 100 Hezbollah and 13,000 missiles. You can just get rid, it, just to try to get rid of the missiles would be a start. Now, that being the case, um, what, what would be a good idea and what would be a victory, I think, for Israel here would be to continue a military campaign. It would still continue to be a difficult military campaign. But to continue the military campaign and be rather better about the way they explained it to the world. Um, one of the most dispiriting things about being in Israel during this period has been seeing, uh, seeing every single individual attack, such as the destruction of the bridges, for instance, or the taking out of the radar facilities on the waterfront of Lebanon, and no explanation from the Israeli government or Israeli military to the international press. I mean, I kept on saying to someone when I was over there, I will lend you a pointy stick and get a general to stand with my pointy stick, and he can, you can do it. Because as it was, the it, presumption has gone around the globe that the Israelis just like blowing up bridges. Nobody explained that the soldiers could be, that the kidnapped soldiers could be spirited across these bridges or that the rocket launchers would be retreating back into northern Lebanon. No one explained that the Lebanese government had provided the information from the radar, which meant that the radar facilities on the seafronts had to be taken out. All that happened was, it was released by the international press, that, that uh, Israel had been bombing the waterfronts of Lebanon. Um, I mean, these sort of basic problems, I don't know why the Israelis don't do this. My only guess is that they decide that people have decided they don't like them, and they're not bothering to try to make people like them. I think that's a great mistake, and it's, it's, it's been revealed here what happens. If you could have got out, there was a letter to one of the, sorry, to, I'll finish the last point on this one. There was a letter to uh, one of the German papers, some of you may have seen, a couple of weeks ago now, from um, a Lebanese man who had left uh, in 2002 after the Hezbollah came into his village and uh, started building their bunkers and putting the missiles in them and then building schools and hospitals on top of the bunkers. And this man writing to the, Lebanese, uh, to the uh, German newspaper explained that he went up to the local sheikh and said, you know, why are you doing this? And the local sheikh said, because this way the Jews lose one way or the other. Either we missile them or they try to get us and the international community will stop them. Now, I think if you could explain, it's not an easy thing to explain to the public how one army that is literally is killing the people is not responsible for those people's deaths. It's not an easy one, I acknowledge that. But I'm sure that people could get this idea if you got the idea out there a bit better, if you got it out there a bit clearer. And I just wish that we had seen that happen. Gentlemen, uh, and then Astrid over there. Uh, Anders Wimbush from uh, Hudson Institute. Uh, you characterized neocons as people who believe that ideas matter. And for those of us who really believe that, uh, when we look around uh, the world today and we think what impact the war of ideas has had upon this landscape, we uh, retreat somewhat disappointed, or at least I do. I, I wonder how you would characterize uh, fighting the war of ideas. Uh, what kind of a report card would you give us? 
Um, American uh, battle of ideas, I'd give a beta plus. Uh, uh, Europe, I'd give a gamma minus. Uh, I mean, it seems to me that one of the, one of the problems that conservatives have had for some time um, has been that we've presumed that we are being, we, we're losing. You know, conservatives are all stripes. We sort of decided that everything is against us, that the best we can do is fight the battle for the next thing that will be lost. And, uh, and, and that's all that, all that we'll be able to achieve is to temporarily sort of put off some decline. And I think that's a mistake. And as I say, I mean, it's, a, it's a, um, an instinctive thing, but it's also a philosophical thing. Is I, I think it's a mistake to, uh, to run on that. I think that uh, conservatives should understand. And as I say, one of the things that revolutionary conservatism, as, as it were, can understand is that you can make things better and that you should try to and you should argue for them. And I believe that the, the result of the last 30 or so years, about 40 years, certainly since the 60s, one of the results of conservatives not fighting this battle of ideas quite as hard as we should have done, letting these basic presumptions go ahead, is, as I say, seen on our streets. I mean, conservatives, for instance, have never bothered, it seems to me, to battle the notion of pro the, the, the whole argument about progress and historical inevitability, um, whereby a liberal, as you call them here, unfortunately, or a leftist, a socialist, can keep on portraying conservatives as only backward-looking, only regressive, only the problem or the hold-up to the great uh, moment when we arri arrive at the hinterland and, uh, and all say thank you. I, I just, I, I, f I fear that the most basic things of the narrative, as well as, um, as, as you know, precise things, have, have been sort of volunteered up by us. So we decided we were going to lose them so we won't bother. And I say we bother. Yes, the gentleman, uh, Roger, did you have a question? I'm Roger Kimball. I'm actually a publisher of Encounter Books, which published this book. I urge you all to buy it. Uh, but I just wanted to um, uh, add something uh, to what Douglas said uh, with respect to this gentleman's question. I think that if uh, it was Hussein Massawi's, uh, the former Hezbollah leader, if, if his um, statement that uh, we are not doing these things, like blowing up school buses and you know, uh, churchyards and so on, we aren't doing these things because we want something from you. We're doing them to exterminate you. I think that's hermetically transparent, as it were, mm. and um, uh, would, would, uh, would, do, would do a lot to, to um, further the understanding of, of what they we're really up against. But I, I wanted to ask you, Douglas, um, something that doesn't really come uh, uh, through in, in, in your book, um, uh, but I'd be curious to know what your, your, your opinion was. Do you consider the Bush administration more or less neoconservative now than in 2003? Less now. Um, but that's not because of individuals. That's not because of, uh, you know, Libby or Wolfowitz or anything like this. That's because I believe of, of, a, of something in the President and of Secretary Rice, which it seems to me f goes to, toward neoconservatism now and has done since, since 2001, but doesn't always stay there. That the impulse is there, but not always the seeing it through. And I think particularly, of course, of Secretary Rice's dealings with Iran, um, which, where I see a sort of a part desire to take a neoconservative uh, attitude to it, and then a sort of fatal backing off of it, which I think is giving out all the wrong messages to Iran, and we might as well not be neocon around the edges, you know, at all, if, if, if that's the case. But it's not to do with individuals. I mean, I, I, I really object to that sort of thing about the sort of purge of the neocons, as if the sort of they all came in in 2001 and took over and then all flew off. I, I, don't, I don't see that at all. But, of course, that's just that the press and so on love talking personalities, whether it's footballers or anyone else. It's uh, you know, peculiarly attractive. Uh, yes, question here. 